Oh, that's my cardiologist reminding me to relax. The beauty of the connected world. I'm going to start with a very short story, a personal story. So how many of you upgraded to iOS 9 a couple of weeks back? I'm sure most of you did. So I upgraded to iOS 9 uh, late night. So the next morning, I was driving to work to downtown. I was driving in 96. Uh, got close to the exit to 10. And it's usually a frustrating moment for me because there's always a traffic clog. And I could feel my phone vibrate. So I picked my phone up. And it said six minutes to 150 West Jefferson. That's my work location. I was wondering, how did my phone know my work location? Because I haven't stored it anywhere. And I started asking a question. This is really weird. Got a little bit upset. But then for a second, I took a step back. Isn't it neat that I have a personal assistant in my pocket predicting how far my work location is? And my frustration levels went down. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Raj Paul, a passionate advocate of connectivity. Uh, I work for an IoT-focused company called Logbridge right here in downtown. I'm going to talk about the connected world and how it could impact us and what's stopping innovation in this field. My last part of my conversation is going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm going to see how you guys react to it. I'm going to start with some interesting statistics. There are 7.3 billion people in the world today. And uh, Cisco did a study where they think in 2008, 2009, the number of connected devices surpassed the human population. Fast forward, 2020, the world's population is expected to be 7.7 .7 billion, and the forecast is 50 billion devices. That's more than six devices for every human being out there. Just imagine the amount of data which these devices could produce and the intelligence we could gather from these devices. So the forecast, again, all these are forecasts. By 2020, we are expected to collect around 40 zettabytes of information. That's essentially a 40 billion gigabytes of information. A gigabyte is 250 songs, and most of our laptops have 256 to 512 gigabytes. So I'm going to start with some interesting stories around connectivity. Uh, the first one is going to be a personal story of mine. So I installed a few Nest thermostats in my house. And uh, last month, I received a nice report called a Nest report. And it reminded me that I wasted 31 hours of energy because I overrode the settings. Right? Because it's so convenient, you reach to your end table, there's a phone, and I can make it cooler if I wanted to. For a second, I thought, oh, now my device is managing me. But on the flip side, look at the amount of energy we could save and help a greener planet. So my next story is uh, my favorite story, OnStar. OnStar has been in business since 97, a pioneer in connected car. So last year, they said they're going to have 4G LTE standard on all the vehicle models. And Chevy came out with an announcement that um, they're going to have proactive diagnostic alerts to drivers so that if a part is going to break, they could predict, and you could take it to the service and try to avoid uh, service recall or anything like that. So that's a pretty powerful story how connectivity helps. So the next one is UPS. I'm sure all of us know what UPS is. And they deliver 4 billion packages every year using 100,000 trucks. And they use connectivity to manage their fleet and logistics better. And they claim to have saved 39 million gallons of fuel. That's straight profit to the bottom line. The last one is GE. Uh, GE uses big data analytics and connectivity to instrument their engines, uh, jet engines. And uh, they could collect 5,000 data points uh, every second. They can build a better product, but they also translate that to a benefit to the airline so that they can save fuel. So what's stopping some of these use cases for us to realize in our day-to-day -day world? Right. Is it because companies are not transparent about how they're using data? Or is it just that there is a trust problem? Or is it that we are not paranoid about privacy and privacy-related issues? So I'll continue with my OnStar story. In 2011, uh, OnStar changed their terms and conditions where they said when a person cancels their subscription, they're still going to leave the unit connected. And 
the interest was so that they could help people when there's a natural catastrophe like Katrina. Onsta played a big role in Katrina. And then they could also collect diagnostics so that they can build a product. There was a huge uproar, privacy, and it was rolled back. So what's wrong with manufacturers trying to understand more about their product? What's wrong if my washing machine contacts the manufacturer or contacts my extended service provider that it's sick, is getting sicker, and is going to die, and somebody comes and looks after the washing machine so that I don't have to have a bad weekend? So what's stopping all these use cases coming out? One big thing which people talk about is privacy. So we have a video to show how people out there in the street think about privacy. I live in Southwest Detroit, and I'd rather not give away my home address. Uh, Clarkston. Um, maybe I don't want to share that. I'd rather not answer that as well. Why do you need that? What's your social security number? Uh, one, two, three. I don't get that up. That's too private. I'm giving a perfect stranger my information. This is what this whole purpose is about. <laughs> what are sort of the reasons why? Um, because I don't know you. Because. You could sell it off to somebody else. If I feel like it's a personal benefit to me, then I will I will let them use my information. It's a mutual agreement. They're, they're something that I want from the app, and so I'm allowing them to have other access so I can get what I want out of it as well. Actually, I turn my location services off most of the time. Really, to me, location services in a phone is built for me to be able to find maybe a, another person or find something, but I would like for nobody to be able to find me. Yeah, what if um, telling me that information could help save your life? Well, yeah, then I would, of course. Ooh, I would have to do it if it's going to save my life. I would have to. If you're getting something out of it, then yeah. But, you know, I guess technology is good for advancement, but there's still negatives with it also. So I don't like it, but it's like I can't live without my phone now. So if you look at the video, it's a pretty interesting demography of people. So the definition of privacy is very subjective, and you can see each one of them have a different perspective on privacy. But you'll also notice that it's pretty evident that people put privacy on the back seat if they get to realize the benefit out of it. So obviously, there is a lack of transparency from manufacturers how data could be used. So on one end, you see a person who is reluctant to share location. I mean, it's like turn everything off rather than being selected to who you can share your location with, which is paranoia and trust problem. But the other end, if you look at Facebook, 2.5 million shares and 4 million likes are done in Facebook every minute. So on Facebook, people are a lot more liberal, but then we use privacy as some of the reasons to stop innovation. So this is some pretty interesting statistics. So. Privacy is a pretty subjective thing. I mean, this video was shot I mean, real. But the other interesting thing is most of those people actually gave information when they signed a release, though they refused to share information. <laughs> so my, I have a son who's a junior. The way he looks at privacy is completely different the way I look at privacy. The definition of privacy is changing, and it's continuing to go to change. So should we basically stop innovation in the name of privacy rather than looking at it with an open mind? Thank you.